Good evening, folks, and welcome back to Beer Time Stories and our reading of Pride and Prejudice. Finally, after a bit of a break. <laughs> Apologies for the absence, but we'll get right back into it. So, chapters 19 and 20. The next day opened a new scene at Longburn. Mr. Collins made his declaration in form, having resolved to do so without loss of time, as his leave of absence extended only to the following Saturday and having no feelings of difference to make it distressing to himself even at the moment, he set about it in a very orderly manner, with all of the observances he w which he supposed a regular part of the business. Ah, yes, supposition. Always a good place to start. On finding Mrs. Bennet, Elizabeth, and one of the younger girls together, soon after breakfast, he addressed the mother in these words. May I hope, madam, for your interest with your fair daughter Elizabeth, when I solicit for the honor of a private audience with her in the course of the morning. Before Elizabeth had time for anything but a blush of surprise, Mr. Mrs. Bennet instantly answered, Oh, dear, yes, certainly. I am sure Lizzie will be very happy. I am sure she can have no objection. Come, Kitty, I want you upstairs. And gathering her work together, she hastened away, when Elizabeth called out, Dear Mom, do not go. I beg you will not go. Mr. Collins must excuse me. He can have nothing to say to me that is already that anybody need not hear. I am going away myself. <laughs> no, no, nonsense, Lizzie. I desire you to stay where you are. And Elizabeth seeming, and upon seeing Elizabeth really, with vexed, embarrassed looks, about to escape, she added, "Lizzie, I insist upon you staying and hearing Mr. Collins." Elizabeth would not oppose such an injunction, and in a moment's consideration, making her also sensible that it would be wisest to get it over with as soon and as quickly as possible, she sat down again and tried to conceal, by incessant employment, the feelings which were divided between distress and diversion. Mrs. Bennet and Kitty walked off, and as soon as they were gone, Mr. Collins began. Believe me, my dear Elizabeth, that your modesty, so far from doing you any disservice, rather adds to your other perfections. You would have been less amiable in my eyes had, it there, had there not been this little unwillingness, but allow me to assure you that I have respected your mother's permission for this address. You can hardly doubt the purport of my discourse. However, your natural delicacy may lead you to disassemble. My attentions have been too marked to be mistaken." Almost as soon as I entered the house, I singled you out as the companion of my future life. Interesting times. <laughs> it's like, yep, that's the one. Yeah. Now, admittedly, while I am all for in-person communication, this the speed with which these things happen. Of course, to digress slightly on this, you have to remember that during this time period, during the Regency era, era Especially in Britain, marriage was not about love, it was about business. It was a business arrangement to further the financial security of both parties. So, you know, romance be, romance be damned, I suppose. Pardon, pardon my French. Where was I? Ah, yes. Almost as soon as I entered the house, I singled you out as the companion of my future life. But before I am run away with my feelings on this subject, perhaps it would be advisable for me to state my reasons for marrying, and moreover for coming into Hertfordshire with the desire of selecting a wife, as I certainly did. The idea of Mr. Collins, with all his solemn composure, being run away by his feelings, made Elizabeth so near laughing that she could not use the short pause he allowed to stop him any further, and he continued. My reasons for marrying are, first, that I see it a right thing for every clergyman in easy circumstance, like myself, to set the example of matrimony in his parish. Secondly, I am convinced it will add very greatly to my happiness, and thirdly, which perhaps I ought to have mentioned earlier, that it is the particular advice and recommendation of every noble lady whom I will have the honor of calling patroness. Twice she has condescended to give me her opinion, unasked, too, on the subject, and it was the very Saturday night before I left Huntsford, between our pools at Quadrille, while Mrs. Jenkins was arranging Miss DeBose's footstool, that she said, Mr. Collins, you must marry. A clergyman like you must marry. Choose properly, choose a gentlewoman for my sake, and for your own, let her be active, let her be an active, useful sort of person, not brought up high, but able to make small income go a good way. This is my advice. Find such a woman as soon as you can, bring her to Huntsford, and I will visit her. Allow me, by the way, to observe, my fair cousin, that I did not reckon the notice and kindness of Lady Catherine de Beau as among the least of the advantages my power has to offer. You will find her manners beyond anything I can describe, and your wit and vivacity, I think, must be acceptable to her, especially when tempered with the silence and respect that her rank will inevitably excite. Thus, much for my general intention in favor of matrimony, 
it remains to be told why my views were directed to Longburn instead of my own neighborhood, where I assure you there are many amiable young women. But the fact is that being as I am to inherit this estate after the death of your honored father, who, however, may live many years longer, I could not satisfy myself without resolving to choose a wife from among his daughters, that the loss to them might be as little as possible when the melancholy event takes place, which, however, as I have already said, may not be for several years. Good God. <laughs> This has been my motive, my fair cousin, and I flatter myself it will not sink me in your esteem. And now nothing remains for me but to assure you in the most animated language of the violence of my affection. The violence of my affection. Man, when Achilles does it better than you. Since I am well aware that <clears throat> since I am well aware that it could not be complied with, and that one thousand pounds and the four percent, which will not be yours after your mother's decease, is all that you may ever be entitled to. On that head thereafter, I shall be uniformly silent, and you may assure yourself that no ungenerous reproach shall ever pass my lips when we are married. It was absolutely necessary to interrupt him now. You are too hasty, sir, she cried. You forget that I have made no answer. Let me do it without any further loss of time. Accept my thanks for the compliment you are paying me. I am very sensible of the honor of your proposals, but it is impossible for me to do otherwise than decline them. I am not now to learn, replied Collins, with a formal wave of the hand, that it is usual for young ladies to reject the addresses of a man whom they scarcely mean to accept, when he first appeals for their favor, and that sometimes the refusal is repeated a second or even a third time. I am therefore by no means discouraged by what you have said, and shall hope to lead you upon the altar ere long. Upon my word, sir, cried Elizabeth, your hope is rather an extraordinary one after my declaration. I do assure you that I am not one of those young ladies, if such young ladies there are, who are so daring as to risk their happiness on the chance of being asked a second time. I am perfectly serious in my refusal. You could not make me happy, and I am convinced that I am the last woman in the world who would make you so. Nay, were your friend Lady Catherine to know me, I am persuaded she would find me in every respect ill-qualified for the situation. Were it certain that Lady Catherine would think so, Mr. Collins said very gravely, but I cannot imagine her ladyship would at all disapprove of you. And you may be certain, when I have the honor of seeing her again, I shall speak in the highest terms of your modesty, economy, and other amiable qualifications. Indeed, Mr. Collins, all praise of me will be unnecessary. You must give me leave so to judge for myself, and pay me the compliment of believing what I say. I wish you very happy and very rich, and by refusing your hand, do all in my power to prevent you from being otherwise. In making me the offer, you must have satisfied the delicacy of your feelings with regard to my family, and may take possession of Longburn Estate wherever it falls, without any self-reproach. This matter may be considered, therefore, as finally settled. And rising as she thus spoke, she would have quit the room, had not Mr. Collins thus addressed her. When I do myself the honor of speaking to you next on the subject, I shall hope to receive a more favorable answer than you have now given me, though I am far from ac accusing you of cruelty at present, because I know it to be the established custom of your sex to reject a man on first application. And perhaps you have even now said to encourage my suit, as would be consistent with the true delicacy of the female character. Really, Mr. Collins, cried Elizabeth with some warmth, you puzzle me exceedingly. If what I hitherto have said to you is any form of encouragement, I know not how to express my refusal in such a way as to convince you of it being one. You must give me leave to flatter myself, my dear cousin, that your refusal of my addresses is merely words of course. My reasons for believing it are briefly these. It does not appear to me that, any, that my hand is unworthy of your acceptance, or that the establishment I can offer would be any other than highly desirable. My situation in life, my connections with the family of Debeau, my relation to your own, that's a weird plus. <laughs> oh, the past. And I suppose the present in certain parts of the world. My relationship to your own are circumstance highly in my favor, and you should take into further consideration that in spite of your manifold attractions, it is by no means certain that another offer of marriage may yet ever be made to you. Your portion is unhappily so small that it will be in all likelihood undo the effects of your loveliness and amiable qualifications. Oh boy. As I must therefore conclude that you are not serious in your rejection of me, I must choose to attribute it to your wish of increasing my love by suspense, according to the usual practice of elegant females. I do assure you, sir, that I have no pretension whatsoever to that kind of elegance, which consists in tormenting a respectable man. I would rather be paid the good golly if I could... <laughs> man, if only that was still a thing. I would rather be paid the compliments of being believed sincere. 
I thank you again for the honor that you have done me in your proposals, but to accept them is absolutely impossible. My feelings in every respect forbid it. Could I possibly speak plainer? Do consider me now as an elegant female and do not consider me now as an elegant female intending to plague you, but as a rational creature speaking the truth from her heart. You are uniformly charming, cried he, with an air of awkward gallantry, and I, am and I am persuaded that when sanctioned by the express authority of both your excellent parents, my proposals will not fail of being acceptable. To such perseverance and willful self-deception Elizabeth made no reply, and immediately and in silence withdrew, determined, if he persisted in con considering her repeated refusals as flattering encouragement, to apply to her father, whose negative might be uttered in such a manner as to be decisive, and whose behavior, at least, could not be mistaken for the affection and coquetry of an elegant female." Chapter 20. Mr. Collins was not left long to the silent contemplation of his successful love, for Mrs. Bennet, having dawdled in the vestibule to watch for the end of the conference, no sooner saw Elizabeth at the door, and with quick step passed her towards the staircase, than she entered the breakfast room and congratulated both him and herself in warm terms on the happy prospect, had the happy prospect of their near connection. Mr. Collins received and returned these felicitations with equal pleasure, then proceeded to relate the particulars of their interview, with the result of which he trusted he would have every reason to be satisfied since the refusal which his cousin had steadfastly given him would naturally flow from her bashful modesty and the genuine delicacy of her character. Oh, boy. This infection, however, startled Mrs. Bennet, or this information over startled Mrs. Bennet. She would have been glad to be equally satisfied that her daughter had meant to encourage him by protesting against his proposals, but dared not believe it and could not help saying so. But depend upon it, Mr. Collins, she added, that Lizzie be shall be brought to reason. I will speak to her about it to myself about it directly. She is a very headstrong, foolish girl, and does not know her own interest, but I will make her know it. Pardon me for interrupting you, madam, madam, cried Mr. Collins, but if she is really headstrong and foolish, I know not whether she would altogether be a very desirable wife to a man in my situation, who naturally looks for happiness in the marriage state. If, therefore, she actually persists in rejecting my suit, perhaps it would be better not to force her into accepting me, because if liable to, de to such defects of temper, she could not contribute much to my felicity." "'Sir, you quite misunderstand me,' said Mrs. Bennet, alarmed. "'Lizzie is only headstrong in such matters as these. "'And everything else, she is a good-natured girl as ever. "'I will go directly to Mr. Bennet, "'and we shall very soon settle with her, I am sure.' "'She would not give him time to reply, "'but hurrying instead to her husband, "'called out as she entered the library. "'Oh, Mr. Bennet, you are wanted immediately. "'We are all in an uproar. "'You must come and make Lizzie marry Mr. Collins, "'for she vows she will not have him, "'and if you do not make haste, "'he will change his mind and not have her.' Mr. Bennet raised his eyes from the book as she entered, fixed them on her face with a calm unconcern which was not at the least altered by her communication. "'Oh, I have not the pleasure of understanding you,' said he, when she had finished her speech. "'Of what are you talking?' "'Of Mr. Collins and Lizzie. Lizzie declares she will not have Mr. Collins, and Mr. Collins begins to say that he will not have Lizzie.' And what am I to do on the occasion? It seems such a hopeless business. Speak to Lizzie about it yourself. Tell her that you insist upon her marrying him. Let her be called down. She shall have my opinion. Mr. Bennet rang the bell, and Miss Elizabeth was summoned to the library. Come here, child, cried her father as he appeared. I have sent for you on an affair of importance. I understand that Mr. Collins has made you an offer of marriage. Is this true? Elizabeth replied that it was. Very well. And this offer of marriage you have refused? I have, sir. Very well. We come now to the point. Your mother insists upon you accepting it. Is this not so, Mrs. Bennet? Yes, or I will never see her again. An unhappy alternative is before you, Elizabeth. From this day you must be a stranger to one of your parents. Your mother will never see you again if you do not marry Mr. Collins. And I will never see you again if you do. <laughs> Elizabeth could not help but smile at such a conclusion of the bargaining, but Mrs. Bennet, who had persuaded herself that her husband regarded the affair as she wished, was excessively disappointed. "'What do you mean, Mr. Bennet, by talking this way? You promised me to insist upon her marrying him.' "'My dear,' replied her husband, "'I have two small favors to request. First, that you would allow me the free use of my understanding on the present occasion, and secondly, of my room.' I shall be glad to have the library to myself as soon as may be. Not yet, however, in spite of her disappointment in her husband, did Mrs. Bennet give up the point. She talked to Elizabeth again and again, coaxed her and threatened her by turns. She endeavored to secure Jane in her interest, but Jane, with all possible mildness, declined interfering. And Elizabeth, sometimes with real earnestness and sometimes with playful, g <laughs> playful gaiety, replied to her attacks. 
Though her manner varied, however, her determination never did. Mr. Collins, meanwhile, was meditating in solitude upon what had passed. He thought too well of himself to comprehend on what motive his cousin could have for refusing him. Man, that's still so weird to me. And though his pride was hurt, he suffered in no other way. His regard for her was quite imaginary, and the possibility of deserving her mother's reproach prevented him feeling any regret. While the family were in this confusion, Charlotte Lucas came to, day, came to spend the day with them. She was met in the vestibule by Lydia, who, flying to her, cried in a half-whisper, "'I am glad you have come. There is much fun here. What do you think has happened this morning? Mr. Collins has made an offer. Mr. Collins has made an offer to Lizzie, and she will not have him.' Charlotte had hardly any time to answer before they were joined by Kitty, who came up to tell the same news, and no sooner had they entered the breakfast room, where Mrs. Bennet was alone, that she would likewise engage upon the subject, calling on Miss Lucas for her compassion and entreating her to persuade her friend Lizzie to comply with the wishes of her family. "'Pray do, my dear Lucas,' she added in a melancholy tone, "'for nobody is on my side. Nobody takes part with me. I am cruelly used, and no one feels for my poor nerves.' Oh, good golly, Mrs. Bennet. Every mother everywhere. Ah, uh, there she comes, continued Mrs. Bennet, looking as unconcerned as may be, and caring no more for us than if she were at York, provided she could have her very own way. But I tell you what, Miss Lizzie, if you take it into your head to go on refusing every offer of marriage in this way, you will never get a husband at all, and I am sure I do not know what is to maintain you when your father is dead. I shall not be able to keep you, and so I warn you. I have done with you from this very I am done with you from this very day. I have told you in the library, you know, that I should never speak to you again, and you will find me as good as my word. I take no pleasure in talking to undutiful children. Now that I not that I have taken much pleasure indeed in talking to anybody. People who suffer as I do from nervous complaints have no great inclination for talking. Nobody can tell what I suffer, but it is always so. Those who do not complain are never pity are never pitied. <laughs> her daughters listened in silence to this fusion sensible that any attempt to return to reason or soothe her would only increase the irritation she talked on therefore without interruption from any of them until they were joined by mr collins who entered with an air more stately than usual and on perceiving whom she said to the girls now i do insist upon it that you all of you hold your tongues and let mr collins and i have a little conversation together Elizabeth passed quietly out of the room. Jane and Kitty followed, but Lydia stood her ground, determined to hear all she could, and Charlotte, detained first by the civility of Mr. Collins, who in whose inquiries after herself and all the family were very minute, and then by a little curiosity, satisfied, satisfied herself with walking to the window and pretending not to hear. In a doleful voice, Mrs. Bennet thus began the protracted conversation. "'Oh, Mr. Collins!' "'My dear madam,' replied he, "'let us be forever silent on this point.' Far be it from me, he presently continued in a voice that marked his displeasure, to resent the behavior of your daughter. Resignation to inevitable evils is the duty of us all. The particular duty of a young man who has been so fortunate as I to have been in early preferment, and I trust I am resigned. Perhaps not the less from less so from feeling a doubt of my positive happiness had my fair cousin honored me with her hand. For I have often observed that resignation is never so perfect as when the blessing denies as when the blessing denied begins to lose somewhat of its value in estimation you will not i hope consider me as showing any disrespect for your family my dear madam by thus withdrawing my pretensions to your daughter's favor and without having paid yourself and mr bennett the compliment of requesting you to impose your authority on my behalf my conduct may i fear may i fear be objectionable in having accepted my dismissal from your daughter's lips instead of your own but we are all liable to error I have certainly meant well through the whole affair. My object has been to secure an amiable companion for myself with due consideration for the advantage of all your family. And if my manner has been at all reprehensible, I here beg to apologize. And we'll go ahead and leave it there on that little cliffhanger because my studio is not air conditioned and it is a very warm day and the suit is very, very hot. So, as always... Remember, folks, you are enough, you are loved, never give up, never surrender. Sleep well, and we'll see you soon.